the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, run the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and renew us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit.
almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The first reading uh, on this, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, is from the book of Amos. Seek the Lord and live, for he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from the levees of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and push the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudence will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph, the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. We will read Psalm 90 was responsible. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us for your steadfast love in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Prosper our handiwork. The second reading is from the book of Hebrews. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must <clears throat> render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. <coughs> Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, looking at him, 
loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at those words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, And who shall be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel or for the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now and in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. I want to start out by reminding that in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is taking a journey. Over the past few weeks, we've been reading gospel messages that start out with Jesus moving. He is moving closer and closer to Jerusalem. This week, we have that message again at the start of our gospel. And we, as Jesus is moving closer and closer, we're also getting some messages about what it means to be in God's kingdom and what it means to have eternal life. Two weeks ago, there was a gospel reading that, that talked about cutting off things that were bringing us into sin. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And it went on to say, for it is better to go into the kingdom of God without whatever, than with it to be thrown into hell. And we heard the message that we were to take whatever was bringing us into sin and cut it out of our life. Last week, we didn't spend much time on the last part of the gospel reading, but it, in the last part it talked about the children coming to Jesus. And the disciples were going to keep them away, but Jesus said, No, let them come to me, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. You know, I really enjoy teaching smaller children because they just absorb the gospel message. When you tell them a Bible story that explains God, they just eat it up. They don't start asking you to defend it. They don't, they don't argue it and question about how it could be true. Just in simple faith, they take it in. For it's to such belong the kingdom of God. Today, in our reading, a man comes up to Jesus and he says to them, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It isn't that the real question of faith what is it that puts me in a right relationship with God? What is it that will guarantee to me that I can have eternal life? Some of you remember back in the 70s, there was a, a big emphasis in our country on evangelism. 
There was James Kennedy's book, Evangelism Explosion. There were those little pamphlets that we would hand out on the four spiritual laws or the ABCs of faith. And in it, it would usually start out with a question. The question was, if you were to die tonight and stand before God, and God would say to you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you answer? When I was in seminary, we were doing evangelism calls for some of the churches around that area. And we would go out to people who had grown up in the church and, and we would say to them that very question, what would you say to God? And they would say, well, I would tell God I, I've tried to keep the commandments, I've tried to live a good life. You know, and it was all about what they had tried to do to get themselves into heaven. So then we would go on and we would talk to them. Starting out first by talking about God's grace and love. For that is the foundation of the gospel message. That God so loved the world. It's God's love and God's grace. And then we would talk to them about the human condition. You know, every week we confess a faith and I, I stand out here and face the altar with you. Because I too are one who is bound in sin. And, and in that human condition we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we do the evangelism calls, it was kind of an illustration to, to show people what that meant. You know, if, if you think you've lived a pretty good life and, and you've got all these merits on this side and, and you think of this as a scale that, you know, your, your merits are over here and your sins are, are much fewer, so therefore, you know, you're going to merit your way into heaven. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. For falling short means even once. Even one sin. How many of you have had one sin in your life? <laughs> you probably had at least one today, right? <laughs> you know, even if we only had three sins a day, that's over a thousand a year. And most of you are old enough that you would add up to quite a few sins in your life. <laughs> We would talk in this illustration and say, think of your friend coming over to your house and, and you're going to make some lunch. And you decide to make your recipe of, of an omelet and your omelet calls for six eggs. So you start breaking the eggs in a bowl. And so the first egg goes in, the second egg, the third egg. You get to the last egg and you break it open and, and whoa, that smell. It's a rotten egg. And you look at your bowl and you say, well, there's five good eggs, only one rotten one. This will be all right. <laughs> That's how we try to serve up our lives to God if we're doing it on our merits. That that one rotten sin, even if it was only one, spoils the whole thing. So our situation as human beings is that no matter how good a life we live, we're not going to merit grace from God. Grace is a free gift. And God's salvation is according to God's plan through Jesus Christ. For we learn next week about this journey that Jesus is on, where it's headed. In next week's reading, it's going to tell us that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross. He tells his disciples very clearly that this is the plan. This is God's plan of salvation. And when we understand that, when we understand that it's all based on what God does through Jesus Christ, it's not our sacrifice for God, but God's sacrifice for us. It's only then that we can respond in faith and trust. It's only then that we know that it is what God does and not ourselves. How is one saved? It is through God's doing. Now that's the message that we've been getting over these few weeks. About getting sin out of our lives, about staying away from divorce, about being as children entering the kingdom. And today, very, very clearly, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The message that we're going to look at 
I want to see three things today. One is a message of salvation that is played out between Jesus' encounter with this man on the road and then later with his explanation to the disciples. That's one important part. The second important part is Jesus' emotions towards that man. And then third, we're going to touch on the warning that Jesus has about wealth and how that can take the place in our hearts rather than letting God be first. Start out today, a man runs up to Jesus. In Mark's Gospel, it doesn't give as much detail as it does in Matthew and Luke. And so we take the story and we know that as three different people kind of tell a story, you know, if I tell a story, it, it's very short. If my wife tells the same story, it could take a long time. <laughs> and she tells me it's because I don't pay attention to the details. So Mark is a short version. He tells us a man runs up to Jesus. In the other Gospels, it tells us more about the man. In one of them, it, it tells us that he's a young man. And the word in the Greek means somewhere between the age of 24 and 40. And that is young to most of us. In another Gospel, it tells us that he was a ruler in the synagogue. And what we take from that is that he was probably a Pharisee who had worked his way up to a place of honor in, in the, the uh, synagogue because of the way he was able to follow God's law. And so this man who has some prestige runs to Jesus. Now, it's not normal that a man would run in that society. But he runs to Jesus, and then he kneels down in the dust both of these acts are truly humbling himself before Jesus. So he is one who is there showing the, uh, the devotion to this man, Jesus. And what he asks of Jesus is, what must I do? Now, he has, we'll find out in a minute, been following the commandments, and yet he knows that there's something lacking. Even though he's been a good Pharisee, even though that he's been involved in what was the, his church, the synagogue, he still feels that there is something missing. Something missing in his relationship to God. And Lenski's commentary said how pathetic this was. Here was a young man so eager to do the good thing so desirous of eternal life, so strongly attracted to Jesus, and yet so far from the right road to eternal life. It was right there in front of him, and Jesus offers it to him, and yet he was so far from accepting it. <clears throat> Jesus starts out with him and with the law. Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. And he was telling the man to remember who God is. He wasn't denying himself as God, but he was remembering that only God is good. That no matter how good we think we are, we're never going to be as really good as only God is good. And then Jesus says, you know the commandments. And the commandments that he lists there are what we call the second tablet of the commandments. The last seven the ones that deal with our relationship with other people, how we live together in society. And Jesus spells those out. He says, yes, I do all those. Almost patting himself on the back. I'm good at those. No problem. And yet he still knows there's something missing. And it tells us that Jesus looked at him lovingly. And in compassion, Jesus is saying, you're lacking still one thing. Jesus knew that that man was failing with the first commandment. One God. One thing at the center of our hearts. One thing that is above everything else, and that is God. But this man was allowing his possessions to take over his heart. 
And when Jesus confronted him about it, he became envious about it. It really hurt him. For he knew that he had a lot of possessions and that he was holding on to them tightly. And he walks away. Jesus started with the law, but then offered him the gospel. You've been depending on the law to get you to God. You've been keeping the commandments. And yet still, we fall short because we can never be good enough. It's about a relationship with God at the center. The man was doing a self-righteous evaluation of his life and looking at others and thinking that he was doing pretty good. But it wasn't satisfactory. Moving on from this situation that Jesus is laying out for him. The way of salvation is to come to God. He says, come and be in a relationship with me. Follow me. Be close to God. The man walked away. But the emotion that Jesus had towards that man, Jesus loved him, is what it tells us in the Gospel. Jesus loved him. Agape love. The greatest love. It wasn't just a brotherly love. It was the love that was used where the Gospel tells us God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That was the love that Jesus felt for this man. We don't know what happened later in that man's life. If things ever turned different for him, the gospel doesn't take us there. The gospel is just showing us what it's been telling us for the last few weeks. Don't let anything stand in the way of your relationship with God. Whether it be a hand or a foot that you cut off, an eye that you pluck out. Whatever it is, don't let anything stand in the way of your relationship to God, especially our possessions. So this warning that Jesus gives in the Gospel about possessions, you don't have to raise your hand about this, but do you feel wealthy? Compared to what? You know, if we look at people like Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, you know, some of the movie stars, we can say, well, I'm not a wealthy person. You know, I didn't even win the Powerball last week. <laughs> We're not wealthy. We look around even at some of the other communities in Columbus area and see some of the huge houses and, and that sell for over a million dollars. You can say, obviously, I'm not wealthy. I don't live in one of those houses. But when we look at a greater perspective, and we think of how we stand in relationship to the world. Do you know that 80% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day? And you might think, well, there's days I don't spend 10 bucks. Well, unless we add in the value of our home and our car and the uh, cable TV and the many other things that we don't even realize we're spending daily. Half of the world's population, over 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. Gary Kukuch was a youth director when I was serving at St. John's. He's also an advisor for the NLC Youth Board. Gary, in his catechism class, still sends the kids home and asks them to do a closet survey. Go into your closet and count how many pairs of shoes you have. That's assuming the kids actually put their shoes away in the closet. <laughs> but how many pairs of shoes do you have? And I bet you every one of the kids in that class has more than one pair of shoes. Gary tells them how many kids in the world don't even have one pair of shoes. And here they have many pairs of shoes. He asked them how many shirts, how many pairs of pants they have. And he then goes on to tell them how many kids in the world only have one set of clothing. We are wealthy. And in our wealth, compared to the rest of the world, we have to heed this warning. For we who have a lot, 
begin to put our dependence on those things. A recent example of that was how we started to hoard things when the pandemic hit, especially toilet paper. You know, we all stocked up on that because we wanted to make sure we didn't run out. But how many people in this world, when they pray the Lord's Prayer and give us today our daily bread, really mean they're depending on God for their daily bread that day? I mean, I can go to our pantry and our kitchen and see that we have enough daily bread to get me through maybe even a month. We get to be dependent on ourselves. And even though we still put God first in our lives and we come here and worship, there's that part of us that still wants to be self-sufficient, still wants to depend only on ourselves. And Jesus is warning against that. And the disciples say then, who can be saved? We're all going to be that way, aren't we? That's part of our sinfulness, part of our humanness, and part of our falling short is that we still want to be self-sufficient. And Jesus says, yeah, that's true. And with humans, it is impossible to be saved. But with God, all things are possible. Even us, who fall in that category of the wealthy of the world, even us who have parts of our lives where God isn't always first, even us, God loves so much that He sent His only Son to die for us so that we can be saved. What our Gospel today is reminding us of is that whatever stands in our way of that relationship with God, we need to turn away from that. We need to follow Jesus. But the gospel message comes in those words. With God, all things are possible. Our salvation comes from Him. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able to confess together using the words of the gospel of Jesus. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of God. to continue our mission in this community. Lastly, 
Give us all patience to endure and continue serving you until our pastoral call is answered. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Teach the world's leaders, and especially those of our own country, to care for people more than prestige, to love justice more than popularity, and to use resources and power for the benefit of all. Grant that they should seek your will above partisan politics or personal gain. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We plead on behalf of all who are sick or injured, imprisoned or lonely, addicted or abused. We pray for all who are troubled by the powers of sin, evil, and death. Grant them the joy of your saving help. Restore them to health, hope, and communion with you and with those who love and care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Gracious Father, Keep in your care all who have died trusting in you, and console all those whose grief runs deep. Sustain, encourage, and refresh us through the toils and trials of this life. Keep us strong in faith toward you, and fervent in love for one another. Bring us into the joy of your kingdom. There, with all your people, let us forever feast on your goodness, and be light in adoring our Savior, united in the power and love of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us share the peace of God. The peace of the Lord be with you all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, to Christ our Lord who rose beyond the bonds of death, and on this day, as he was promised, poured out your spirit of life and power upon his chosen disciples. At this the whole earth exalts in boundless joy, and so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Yes, no. 
Let's pray. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of a godly life. And it was to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.